I'm Jimmy, the EMS Avenger. This is 20 Minutes to Save the World. And I am here with Maya. You might know her as Maya Wanderlust on TikTok. And she hosts the Grodio Rodeo. Maya, are we just full of shit? Because I feel like it some days. And I know that you do. Uh, I feel like shit most of the days. Like I'm full of shit most of the days. Um, but I'm starting to figure out that kind of all of us feel that way. So we're all in like this little full of shit circle together. But I think that we experience it in greater degrees as content creators. And we've talked about this behind the scenes. I know you actually took a break from social media because you were really struggling with imposter syndrome. And that's what this whole thing is really circling around is, is struggling with imposter syndrome. syndrome. So um, give me a little bit of background on how that started to become an issue for you. Um, so I think probably all of us within this field experience it. My earliest experiences were when I was much younger, but it has always been centered around a scholastic setting. Um, I've never felt like I was smart enough to uh, accomplish one thing or another, but magically I would always pull through it. And I just kind of attributed that to being a tenacious person. Um, also somebody who just never gave up. I've always been very headstrong in what my goals were and things of that nature. Um, but college was very difficult, uh, because I could, I always felt like I never knew what I wanted to do. And I was having a crisis every three to six months about, am I doing the wrong thing? Do I really want to do this? So I think that a lot of young people also experience it in that, uh, capacity because, there is so much thrown at you very quickly in this world and you feel so pressured to make a decision that day on who you need to be and what you need to be doing. Um, EMS was the first career choice that I ever felt like this is what I know I'm supposed to be doing. Um, I immediately felt a draw, I felt a pull and I have not wanted to stray away or find a different career path since. I've been doing this for five years, um, but I always wanted to know how to do more. I always wanted to do more. So staying a career EMT, not that there's anything wrong with that. We, we love our very well-versed EMTs who are committed to their practice and being the best level of care that they can be. But my goal was always to get to paramedic because I wanted to have a maximum skill set. I wanted to be able to help people in a greater capacity and do the most that I could do for the community and the people around me. But as I was going through schooling for all of those levels, because I did basic, advanced, and then paramedic, I always felt like, do I really know what I'm doing? Am I just winging it? Am I really doing the fake it till you make it uh, song and dance? Because a lot of the time, and I'm sure that somebody along the way, one of your mentors or many of your mentors also told you, hey, if you don't know what you're doing, you fake it till you make it because everybody is looking to you to lead the charge. And while that is something that we need to hold on to, right? Like we need, need to be able to stick to our guns and have the gumption to follow through on what we're doing. That can be really intimidating. And if you don't know what you're doing, that can be detrimental to you, your partner and your patient. So I've always been kind of the same way that I've just had this drive to keep knowing more. Like I have never been satisfied with the information that has been given to me, which made me a really annoying student in EMT school and in paramedic school. And I had to be told, hey, can you just sit on some of this stuff and we can talk about it after class? Um, I've always wanted to keep moving. And I, I, I have to believe that there's somewhat of a correlation between that type of personality and the simultaneous even contradictory belief that you actually know next to nothing, that you are faking it, that you are just a good test taker who happens to be able to differentiate between the likelihood of correct uh, answers on a test. But in reality, when put to a pinch, you, you just really don't know anything because I feel like that a lot. Uh, and I feel like that there are, that there are, people struggling with imposter syndrome that bookend the phenomenon. There are the people that are coming in that are very intimidated by knowledge and, and struggle with knowing that they could actually potentially possess this knowledge. Yes. That, and, and it becomes a huge barrier to them. But then there's people like us who are on the other side of it 
who actually don't believe that they possess all of this knowledge. And the people uh, on one side of the spectrum are looking at us, probably looking at us as phenomenal educators and content creators and providers where we're looking at ourselves like people, ha uh, somebody's going to see through my bullshit at some point and call me out. And that was always one of my biggest fears, especially um, getting on TikTok. Like, Rodeo Rodeo was never supposed to take off and be what it became. Um, it was literally just me telling stories about calls that I had been on. And it was a way of, like, me venting, but also remembering those experiences. Because I'm one of those people that has to do something repetitively or say it out loud or write it down in order for me to, like, commit it to memory. Um, so when Grodio Rodeo took off, I immediately started spazzing because I was like, I am not this like brilliant, all knowing paramedic that like, I felt like people put me on this platform thinking I was, and I'm like, oh, they're going to find out I'm a sham. There's no way that, um, I could live up to this expectation of what people really think I am. Because if you know me, uh, on a more intimate level, you know that I'm a nervous wreck, you know that I'm spastic, you know that I have crippling ADHD, and I can barely focus on one thought to the next. Um, but I've also found that people are very forgiving. People do not expect you to be some A-list celebrity. They are completely okay with you being a normal, down-to-earth, relatable person. And that whole idea that there needs to be this facade that you put on a display of being somebody else is totally up here. It doesn't exist. <laughs> I also cannot just absorb information that is being given to me. Like I'll sit, I've sat through numerous critical care classes and vent classes and all this stuff. And if I'm not using it, number one, I can't retain it. And Number two, it, the first time it's explained to me, you might as well just be speaking Chinese. I, I need to read it and I need to read it over and over and then I need to do over and over. over. Uh, otherwise, it's just no good. I just I just can't take it in. Um, but, you know, um, the notion of. Of us being this this package deal that are all knowing, uh, I, I, I think of myself as somebody that's just really good at explaining things at best. Uh, you know, I do a lot of reading and um, I'll write notes to myself and kind of teach myself a subject. And I may have known nothing about that the day before I talk about it on social media. And, and in those cases, I certainly don't come from a place of expertise. I just bring out data. But I think that a lot of people who are, are kind of on the far end of the spectrum where they've started accumulating a lot of knowledge really just see themselves as storytellers or of accumulating information on one side and then regurgitating it on the other. I doubt that many people really look at themselves as, uh, you know, a five tool player. <laughs> Absolutely. I would tend to agree with you on that. Um, I, I, to relate a story, I, because I, I, I really want to give hope to people out there who feel like they fall short. You know, they, they see you out there telling these these great stories, which I love when we get uh, an episode of the Grodio Rodeo. It is it just makes my day. Um, or they they see me teaching, and I think people feel like, man, there is such an obstacle between me and them. How can I ever get to that point? How can I ever reach this point where I'm not messing up anymore? Uh, where I'm doing everything right and I wish people could see our mess ups, you know, um, and I'm going to I'm going to relate a story. Uh, just I feel like I'm almost obligated out of a sense of humility. So I made the change from 911 to pediatric critical care a year ago. They don't just throw you in the field so you can go start innovating kids. You have to go through their airway program and we're getting to the end of that program and they're running us through these drills and getting us to the point where we can go board before our medical director. And I ran one of my practice drills and man, I, to put it the way they said when I was in the Navy, I screwed the pooch. Um, I just got it completely wrong. And part of the reason was, is because I was thinking like a 911 medic. And so I came in there with my 911 tools and tried to fix the patient. 
And in 911, when the only tool you have is a hammer, like a BVM, then everything is a nail. And in critical care, we have all this technology and all these diagnostics. And they wanted me to live in that world, in that scenario. And I, and I probably a little bit out of fear, backed into what I knew, which was the BVM and my 911 experience. And that did not serve me well there. So I, I want people to see that on a daily basis, we revert back sometimes to our childlike mentalities. We get it wrong. We're still screwing up. In fact, the only reason why I do things well is because at one point I did them poorly. Absolutely. I would tend to agree. Um, especially for newer providers or when you get into a level of care that is new to you, right? I feel like we put a lot of pressure. There is, there. is I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There is pressure to be your best, whatever your best might look like. Only you know the metric and the gauge on that, right? But there is this crushing pressure that is associated with fear when you're in a new level of care or a new provider that you need to be the best out of the gate. Prior to EMS, I was a cake decorator. I didn't know anything about medical care right? But what is going to set you apart um, from your daily, I'm just here to collect a paycheck type of providers versus being a really good provider is your will and your drive to know and like know as much as you can and be teachable. Always be teachable. Um, you will never know anything. And to relate back to what you were saying about having a sense of humility, I think having a sense of humility will take you a very long way in this field because the only way that we as providers get better is when people are sick and dying. If we're being very frank about that, people have to be sick. People have to be in need of us in order for us to learn, in order for us to do better as the medical field, as pre-hospital field, as in-hospital field. Um, our line of work is taking care of sick people. And that's where our our learning experience is going to come from. So yeah, we're going to mess up. Yeah, we're, we might not act uh, quick enough or we might not do what we needed to do in a fast enough fashion. But every single time you have an experience like that, every time that you get something that has the potential to bring you low, Take that as a learning experience to take you high. Absolutely. You really have to embrace the wrong moments, you know, those and treat them like gold. I remember um, I, I was very new to the field or I was uh, a new paramedic and I had only been a paramedic for maybe a month or two and had a respiratory call. And, you know, when we're new to the field, it's so hard sometimes to navigate COPD, CHF and kind of, you know, kind of get to that point where you're really confident in which pathology you're dealing with. Absolutely. You know, when you get way past that point, you look back and you're like, how did I confuse the two? But, but people don't realize actually how difficult it is to differentiate them. But I gave solumedrol to a CHF patient thinking it was COPD. And I remember the doctor saying, you gave solumedrol to this guy. This is a CHF issue. And he goes, bad choice. And I was like, oof, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that stuck with me, but I was like, I am not going to protest this. I'm going to wear this like a badge of honor right now because I just learned something, you know, and those, you're right. That humility is such a huge part of your advancement in the field. And you touched on two other things, which was, um, well, that's actually kind of, it's the same thing. The willingness to be wrong, the willingness to accept being wrong, but also wanting to know more. I always tell people one of the biggest, uh, tools in your toolbox and advancing in the field is to be curious. I, I see, I see providers all the time that do assessments and they ask three or four questions and they just peter out because they just lack a sense of curiosity in what's going on with the patient. And you really need to foster that sense of curiosity and, and want to just want to know everything that you can. I agree. I agree. And I think that I think that's another thing is as more as the more experience we get, right? The more veteran providers that we become, I think 
that we have a hard time encouraging that and pushing people to go beyond, right? So I was very blessed in having um, mentors and preceptors who had had their card for the majority of my life, or maybe their card was even older than me, but they pushed me to constantly do better, be more aggressive, do your research. Like, and the same way that you love to read and you do your research so that you can educate uh, the greater public, which I love. I've learned so much from watching your videos and everything. Thanks. And I like implement that on a daily basis. Um, I, and I see you too, when you're liking my statuses. I do. I'm like, Oh, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that's the attitude when we're, you know, when we're FTOs or when we're preceptors, when we're mentors, we really have to help foster and nurture that ferocious drive to want to do and know more. Because when we don't do that, that's when we create what I like to call mediocre medics. Um, and that might be a harsh term, but we all know them. We all know the people who got content and complacent and our patients suffer because of that complacency this is not a field where you can afford to be comfortable the best medics that i know are still striving after a decade two decades of being in this field they're still striving to know more and do more um, um, i'm gonna i'm gonna interrupt you right there because i don't want to lose this thought because there's a, a double meaning to this is a field where you can't afford to be comfortable there we and and you touched on this. We all know those mediocre medics, those mediocre providers who stopped learning the day they got out of paramedic school, right? And they become uh, an impenetrable fortress to new information. Mm -hmm. Not only does that affect patient care, where the patients can't afford them to be like that, they literally, from a financial standpoint, can't afford to be like that because mm -hmm. if you are that. If you are this person who's unwilling to take in new information and to learn and grow and develop a sense of humility and culture of willingness to accept new information and dispense with information that you've been told is wrong, then all you're going to be is a tool that a service wields rather than somebody in control of your own destiny, and you will be compensated accordingly. Yes. And that I, that's perfectly worded the way you said it and that is the reason why the entire field of EMS cannot progress to the heights that we need it to in order to do better for the communities that we service right so it's it has always been a battle of we're not compensated well we don't have the tools that we need we don't have the equipment that we need we're running on bare bones we're understaffed those are all huge uh issues that contribute to the overlying umbrella issue as to why we can't progress but we will not get those things and we will not move towards those things if we as providers do not step up our game and show that we are deserving of those things i'm not saying that we should be um, treated as bottom, bottom of the barrel first responders but there is a direct correlation there between doing your best and receiving the best there is a give and take relationship Absolutely. And what do you think is the key for, for people who espouse that belief? How can they create a downward flow towards people coming into the field and get them to accept that motivation and to get them to come out of paramedic school ready to learn more and do more and to stay fluid and porous? Um, to put it very simply, there has to be a level of self-accountability. And you have to also be willing to take that feedback. You have to be in a mindset of understanding. We have, I'm very staunch on this belief. Okay. We have to let go of this paragod mentality. If you were the best, you'd be a doctor or you'd be a surgeon, right? There's a reason that we stay in this field. And there's a reason that we have seen people go beyond to the next level or a higher level of care or commit to being a lifelong student. You have to want that. And if you don't want that, I don't think that you're in this field for the right reasons. 
That concludes this episode of EMS Avenger, 20 Minutes to Save the World. I was going to have Maya take us out with a story from the Grodio Rodeo, which she did, but the story went on so long and it was such a good story. I wanted to release it as a bonus episode. So that's what's coming up next. See you next time.